Um, so my name is Noah Carcaton. I'm a uh, sophomore in ILR here at Cornell. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers. So our first speaker, or not in no particular order, is uh, Professor Sakai. Uh, Nikos Sakai teaches in the departments of Comparative Literature and Asian Studies and is a member of the graduate field of history at Cornell University. He has published in a number of languages in the fields of comparative literature, intellectual history, translation studies, the studies of racism and nationalism, and histories of semiotic and literary multitude. He has led the project of Traces, a multilingual series of books providing an, inter, uh, an international space for cultural theory and translation to be practiced and discussed from disparate sites, whose editorial office is located at Cornell. Professor Sakai served as its founding senior editor from 1996 to 2004. Professor Sakai also serves on several editorial boards, including positions uh, East Asia, Cultural Critique, Post-Colonial Studies, International Dictionary of Intellectual History, Modern Japanese Cultural History, among others. Uh, another speaker we're gonna have today is Julian Victor Koshman. J. Victor Koshman is a professor in the Cornell History Department, whose research is the nexus between political thought and action primarily but not exclusively in 20th century Japan. He's an expert on Japan and her history and has written numerous articles and book chapters on the subject. He's been awarded the Japan Foundation Professional Fellowship for Research in Japan and has served as a visiting professor of area and cultural studies in the graduate school at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies from 2001 to 2002. He's also a he also served as a visiting professor of Japanese studies at the National University of Singapore in 1999. Um, the third speaker on our panel, sitting down at the end, has been uh, is uh, Professor Brett DeBerry. She has been director of Cornell Society for the Humanities from 2003 to 2005, and a director of the Visual Studies Program from 2000 to 2003. She holds a joint appointment with the Department of Asian Studies and the Department of Comparative Literature at Cornell, and she too has published countless articles on the subject of Japan. Um, our, these three speakers will each come up and give about a 15 to 20 minute talk about the uh, Japanese earthquake. And then we will um, commence with questions. They'll be able to ask each other questions. Everybody else can ask each other questions. After which, we'll do uh, three readings. The first by Professor DeBerry. And then we're going to have um, Naomi uh, Nakata Larson, who's a senior lecturer of Japanese language here in the Asian Studies Department. Ms. Larson uh, received her uh, Master's in Arts in English and American Literature in 1989 from uh, Sakai University in, uh, to in to uh, Tokyo. Prior to Cornell, she taught at Williams College in the great state of Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> since she came to Cornell in 1992, she has taught all levels of courses, including Japanese Falcon. She also taught in Cornell's Japanese teacher training workshops during the summer. She has received a John M. and Emily B. Clark Distinguished Teaching Award in 2003. And following her will be a uh, presentation on the uh, Japanese bamboo flute, the, uh, I'm gonna butcher this, I'm so sorry, Shaka, Shakuhachi, Shakuhachi thank you. Um, Miss Ichiwaka received her Master's in Arts in Linguistics in 2003 from Indiana University and her BA in Japanese Music uh, from Tokyo University of Fine Arts and Music. She served as a Japanese language instructor at Bradley University, as well as at Cornell prior to pursuing her MA. Ms. Ichikawa, sorry, formal education, cultural background, and prior teaching experience, combined with her knowledge of other Asian languages, allows her to contribute in a unique way to the Japanese and Chinese language programs. Her passion in life is traditional music, and she plays the Japanese bamboo flute, which she'll be playing for us today. Um, I'm just gonna quickly speak about the earthquake before we get started with the panel discussion. So just provide some background information for people who might not be aware. So the Great East Japan earthquake was a 9.0 magnitude undersea mega thrust earthquake off the coast of Japan on Friday, March 11th of this year. The results of the earthquake were immediately disastrous. The earthquake triggered extremely destructive tsunami waves of up to 124 feet that struck Japan minutes after the quake, in some cases traveling up to six miles inland. The Japanese National Police Agency has confirmed over 14,000 deaths, over 5,000 injured, 
and just under 12,000 people missing, as well as over 125,000 buildings damaged or destroyed. Around 4.4 million households in northeastern Japan were left without electricity and 1.5 million without water. Many electrical generators were taken down and at least three nuclear reactors suffered explosions due to hydrogen gas that had built up within their outer containment buildings after cooling system failure. Estimates of the earthquake's magnitude make it the most, make it the most powerful known earthquake to have hit Japan and one of the five most powerful earthquakes in the world overall since modern record keeping began in 1900. Japanese Prime Minister Khan said, quote, in the 65 years after the end of World War II, this is the toughest and most difficult crisis for Japan, end quote. Japan's government said the cost of the earthquake and tsunami that devastated the Northeast could reach $309 billion, making it the most expensive natural disaster on record. The aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami included both a humanitarian crisis and a major economic impact. The tsunami resulted in over 300,000 refugees in, uh, and shortages of food, water, shelter, medicine, and fuel for survivors. We all understand... <coughs> oh, sorry about that. I missed the participant in the readings. Um, <laughs> I'll do that in one minute. So we all understand the objective statistics on disasters like this. And while body counts and damage assessments paint a particularly ugly picture, the fact of the matter is that it can only attribute one type of harm, physical. An event like the earthquake can leave an entire nation as shaken emotionally as it is physically. It is in recognition of this fact that we meet today through the internet. We reach out our hand to our friends in Japan in consolidation with not just their physical pain, but also their emotional through this technology, we transcend, the we transcend the constraints of distance in order to reach out to those whose time of need is nigh, knowing that were they in our shoes, they would do the same. We meet today thousands of miles away from the tragedy to share our support for those whose lives have been harmed by a particularly potent act of God. And I can't thank you all enough for being here. Now, because I apparently lost a page on my way here, I'm gonna talk about our fourth participant in the readings, Doctor, or Professor uh, Kayusha Hiroto, Katsia Hiroto, who's in the Department of History, who's published extensively on cultural politics, cultural studies, intellectual and social history in Central Asia, in East Asia. Sorry about that. <laughs> Do truly apologize. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, um, Professor Tashima. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here uh, today. Um, in uh, sort of thinking about what to talk about, uh, I, I really was in a quandary, I have to admit. Uh, there's so many possibilities and so few of them that I know uh, anything particular about, uh, more than really any of you. And uh, after sort of thrashing about and spending a lot of time uh, on a lot of different websites, the, the web is is a morass when it comes to the disaster in Japan now, as you probably uh, have found. It's, uh, it's getting harder and harder to really find uh, anything that is, uh, that, that is what you want, uh, lots of other things. In any case, uh, I'm really ending up uh, with a, a speaking sort of in a, in a critical vein about uh, predominantly the, the American, but also the, the foreign uh, coverage uh, of, this, uh, of this crisis. Uh, and that, uh, as I said, had not been what I had originally intended, but it's how it's turned out. News of Japan, as many of you might be aware, uh, I think is relatively sparse uh, in any case, uh, if we consider the importance of, of Japan internationally. Uh, and it seemed quite clear that uh, the Japanese, uh, not the, I'm sorry, that the American media, uh, at least, were unprepared. Uh, well, everybody was unprepared for this disaster, but they are supposed to prepare to send people very quickly to any part uh, of the world. Uh, and it seems that they were particularly unprepared uh, to send people to. Uh, to Japan, uh, and uh, and so the early reporting uh, on this crisis was uh, was it had its ups and downs, uh, you might say, um, and a lot of uh, of what uh, cable news particularly usually relies upon, of course, in in cases like this, is the the, the, the so-called man in the street interviews, uh, where. Uh, they try to introduce a, a human uh, perspective 
uh, not always uh, very skillfully, uh, but uh, th this particularly uh, we seem to, to miss. There, there were certain reporters, I remember one uh, woman, CNN uh, reporter uh, based in Japan, uh, who was Chinese uh, background, at least judging from her name, uh, and uh, as uh, Tim Goodman, I remember seeing her too, but uh, Tim Goodman also points out, he's a media, media critic, uh, that she probably did the best uh, job of anyone in, in actually interviewing uh, people, partly because uh, she's a long-time resident in Japan and, and sort of know, knew how to go about that. Uh, but, but many of them were very, uh, very unskillful. Um, and uh, I, I debated about whether to, to include this, but, uh, but at the risk of, of introducing a degree, a degree of levity that may seem a little bit out of place, uh, on this occasion, I, I couldn't resist quoting uh, this media critic, Tim Goodman's characterization of the CNN interview style. He writes, how is it possible that in mid-March, with the earthquake in Japan, a CNN reporter can ask this question, how scary has this been for you? <laughs> and then goes on uh, in, in a hypothetical answer. Let's see, my daughter was ripped from my arms in the tsunami. I almost died. I lost my home, my belongings, family, friends. There are constant aftershocks, new tsunami warnings, and apparently we're about to have a nuclear meltdown. I don't know, dumbass, how scary does that sound to you? <laughs> <laughs> of course, this is not the way people answer. Uh, see um, but watching it at home, we may have wanted to. Uh, the point, however, that I want to make here has to do less with the overall quantity of news reporting. Uh, I, I merely want to contend that perhaps in part as a result of initial difficulties with interviewing, uh, but certainly not solely because of that, the Western news media soon tended to shift to a more distant observational stance vis-a-vis -vis their Japanese subjects, rather than reporting on the disaster as such, which ordinarily would have included men-on-the-street interviews and dialogues with Japanese individuals. The media took up a discourse on Japanese culture and personality, focused on what uh, was variously known uh, as, uh, as Japanese stoicism, forbearance, calmness in the face of the crisis, uh, and uh, so on. This is uh, all kind of uh, glosses on the Japanese term gaman, for those of you that are studying Japanese. And I could, could cite a number of, uh, of different examples uh, of this, uh, and if you want some of the examples, I can go through them, but I suspect that any of you that have spent uh, very much time at all uh, surveying Western treatment of this, uh, of this disaster uh, have come across references to this, if not employing the Japanese term gaman, then, uh, then the, the English equivalents of it. In other words, there's been a lot of commentary uh, on the, what seemed to be the calm stoicism of the Japanese uh, when confronted uh, with uh, this disaster. Now, there are several problems, of course, with, uh, with this, uh, although I should say at the outset that I'm not at all here to, uh, to, to deny uh, that Japanese uh, do, uh, in, in the most admirable way, at least many of them, uh, show uh, calm forbearance and, and, uh, uh, and unwillingness to engage in looting and, and these other things that are, are thought to follow from, from this attitude. Uh, it's a, uh, those who do uh, display that uh, in the most positive sense are a model uh, for all of us, and I, nothing that I, I want to say uh, should be construed to, uh, to deny that. But there are problems. In the first place, uh, from rather early on in the crisis, um, there has been ample evidence that uh, the Japanese are not at all hesitant to complain. I mean, one of the, the characteristics that is thought to go along with this Naman or stoic attitude uh, is a, a reluctance to complain, uh, that you merely put up with, uh, with the situation as it's been uh, dished out to you, and, uh, uh, and, and to complain is, uh, is seen as, uh, as uh, uh, somehow um, not strong uh, and, uh, and being unable to, to bear up. The kind of, of evidence that I'm talking about that this has not always been the case, of course, is, is that of, uh, of demonstrations uh, in various places across Japan, uh, predominantly against nuclear power. Um, a, a for uh, an April 10 uh, report, uh, for example, 
had it that 3,000 people were marching through central Tokyo to protest the country's nuclear power plants. Demonstrations were also taking place in a Tokyo suburb and two other places at the same time on the 10th of April. That one of these others drew 15,000 people to the near suburban Tokyo city of Koenji, where they protested against another different nuclear plant that is seen as similarly dangerous, the Hamaoka plant. The atmosphere was festive with people in costumes, band giving live performances, groups of musicians playing drums, and traditional Japanese festival music while people walked in protest and carried signs. Any nuclear street protests, in fact, if you've paid attention, have been held virtually every weekend recently, as well as scores of public lectures on nuclear power, most of them against it, some of them on the other side, petition signings and various other anti-nuclear events. Fishing industry representatives have similarly protested against the dumping of radioactive water into the seas, fearing with probably very good reason that this at least has the potential of ruining their fishery in that area in perpetuity. Residents near the Fukushima plants themselves have protested, on some occasions going down to Tokyo in front of the Tokyo Electric Power Company headquarters. Farmers have protested. There were recently 200 farmers in Tokyo who brought cows along as part of their demonstration, all sort of against nuclear energy in one way or another. So complaining, at least in a way that they hope will be productive, is not at all out of the ordinary in Japan, and it continues at this moment. Another fairly obvious problem with this discourse on Oman, if you will, is that more often than not, observations regarding the calm, law-abiding orderliness of the Japanese are combined with remarks regarding the sharply contrasting behavior of unnamed other nationalities in times of disaster, although now and then Haitians and others are mentioned by name, who loot and engage in violent behavior. Often the commentator will add that one sees this behavior even in the United States, and of course the listener is immediately referred implicitly to New Orleans, for example. In other words, the Japanese disaster is reduced to one more opportunity to direct attention back at ourselves. A second problem, or third problem, actually, is that in a somewhat perverse way, the more that is said about the Japanese capacity to endure, the less serious the disaster might seem. In other words, the ability of the Japanese to maintain calm and order suggests in a subtle way that it might not be so bad after all. This relieves us, therefore, of vicarious pain and trauma. A third problem is that the positive image of a long-suffering, orderly, and socially conscious populace can easily convert into the negative image of a conformist, obedient automaton easily mobilized by fascists. This, of course, was precisely the image of Japanese that was disseminated by the Allies as part of their wartime propaganda, and which sort of remains in echoes, sort of coming out every once in a while. Again, this is not necessarily, it's not necessarily the case that this is a lie at all, and we don't really have time to get it. It would have to be a whole different kind of, at a much longer lecture in order to go into the realities that are perhaps such as we can grasp at the moment at all. But in any case, as part of the news reportage, it seems to me that this is very problematic. Finally, it seems to me that the detached observational stance adopted in order to develop the discourse on Gaumont was problematical because it implied that the Japanese are different from us, and therefore difficult to understand and communicate with. This discourse on and about, rather than with the Japanese, introduces a mode of coverage that is distant, objectifying, and detached. Now, rather than being introduced to Japanese, whom we, at least vicariously, 
can engage with in dialogue and seek to understand and empathize with, we are encouraged to scrutinize them like bugs in amber. In conclusion, I would merely suggest that to the contrary, in this time of great suffering and death in Northern Japan, we need rather to engage and to try to be with those who are directly affected. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, well, I must um, uh, first confess that actually, uh, in terms of uh, facts and statistics, I do not think I, I, I have a better idea of the uh, situation in Japan than most of you here. And I think I'm getting the same kind of uh, uh, news and, 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 and figures uh, from mass media. Um, I s happen to spend uh, a week uh, late, uh, towards the end of, of March in, in Japan. And then, um, lucky enough, uh, uh, I uh, noticed a few things which I couldn't expect while I was uh, uh, in the United States. So I'd like to, to uh, focus on, on three uh, major points uh, because I'm already um, uh, a big covered a uh, certain uh, important aspect of uh, the information about Japan and the way that information is propagated in the United States. And then I'm sure that the um, uh, Brett will uh, discuss certain important aspects. So let me limit my scope first of all. And immediately, uh, probably you are fully aware of this, um, just like the, the accident at uh, Chernobyl, um, this uh, uh, earthquake and the tsunami and then subsequent uh, nuclear disaster at Fukushima Daiichi uh, a nuclear power plant uh, disclosed the so-called limits of national sovereignty. That is, uh, it was actually uh, totally impossible to contain disaster into the national territory, even though in, uh, geographically it was uh, located farther from, from, from the Asian continent. So that in a sense, I think uh, first, I think J Japanese government assumed uh, it was possible to uh, uh, contain this disaster within the, the uh, uh, range that uh, Japanese state can, can somewhat control. And I'm not denying that the, 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 this is a sort of the instant which really uh, 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 highlighted the, the function of the state. But at the same time, it also became very, very um, uh, obvious that the, there's no way this disaster could be simply talked about within the, uh, the range of, of uh, Japanese uh, national sovereignty. Immediately <coughs> after the disaster was reported, many scientists and engineers uh, started expressing their opinions. And in fact, for most of the, the engineers and scientists who are involved in nuclear industry and technology, this accident was nothing new. They've been talking about the possibility of this accident for a long time. And, and, and many of them, uh, this accident cannot be handled in, in, within the national uh, uh, territory and national sovereignty simply because technology itself was imported from the United States originally, and then they are all bound by the international treaties, and then on top of that, uh, there is a, a complicated situation uh, 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 related to the relation between the United States and Japan. That is, the United States and, and Japan has a, a sort of a military connections, which restrict the, the uh, uh, circulation of certain nuclear information and, and, and 
Hence, the, in fact, the uh, Japanese government, for instance, cannot control certain aspects of uh, technology used in uh, uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant. Hence, immediately, they need to rely upon the help from the United States and international organizations. But at the same time, the citizens' movement, it's very, very interesting. Uh, I just mentioned two organizations. Uh, one in, within Japan, it's called uh, Citizens uh, 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 Nuclear Industry Center. That is, the, uh, it's a, a group of, of uh, uh, engineers and scientists who are very much concerned about basically these anti-nuclear uh, uh, activist organization, but they've been working for the last uh, nearly 40 years. And then uh, they have a, a very extensive network of, of engineers and scientists. And from the beginning, they stated, this incident cannot be handled within the national or nationality, so to say. And likewise, in last uh, month, uh, people who are very much concerned about the, the uh, nuclear and environmental destruction uh, in France, well, it's centered, it's, it's not uh, only in France, but it's uh, the network called Multitude uh, issued the new statement saying that, in fact, the, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear uh, uh, power plant should be a controlled, the, the, the uh, interesting term, they should be controlled by, by world citizens. Uh, you can find this, uh, their statement, uh, it's, it's called Appeal to Fukushima. And then, um, so there are a number of movements uh, showing that, in fact, it is possible to create network of people to deal with the uh, nuclear disaster and then control of, of uh, nuclear technology in the future. I think one of the reasons, this is uh, my third point, is that uh, while I was uh, uh, staying in Japan, I was actually shocked to find the quality of mass media operating in Japan. That is, Actually, they refuse to release any uh, uh, decisive information about uh, 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 this accident and then uh, all sorts of, of, of uh, problems they encountered in uh, areas affected by the earthquake and, and, and tsunami. And actually, this morning, I think, uh, New York Times put up a very good article about the, what's they call, nuclear village. So it's a very tight, exclusive network of uh, corporations and bureaucrats and, 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 and scientists and, and, and engineers. And then they try to protect their uh, interests so that they would never release the uh, important information to, for instance, residents of the area affected by uh, nuclear disaster and so forth. And, but this has been very well known. And in the sense that the mass media, I, I discovered, was very, very sympathetic towards the victims of earthquake and tsunami, yet you cannot find any um, um, significant information, technological information, or what politically, what caused these disasters. And then and, um, comparatively, now we now uh, know that it was fairly easy to avoid this accident. Yet, necessary measures were not taken, even if for uh, um, about eight years ago, and then six years ago, and uh, three years ago, and then actually just before uh, the, the uh, earthquake, that is in February, the um, Safety Commission issued the warning about the danger of, of, of accident, yet all these uh, uh, warnings were completely ignored. And then there's no explanation uh, available in Japan 
uh, as far as uh, mass media is concerned, about why this kind of, of, of uh, political mistake and, 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 and um, uh, uh, disasters uh, uh, was uh, uh, caused. And now I think uh, I learned from my friends in Japan and so forth, actually nowadays uh, many uh, uh, people in Japan and uh, fairly well-educated people in Japan do not rely upon American, uh, sorry, uh, Japanese mass media like TVs and newspapers. Instead, they direct, uh, connect to the digital uh, sources of information so that they can actually find all the necessary uh, information about the, for instance, including articles uh, uh, published in New York Times. New York Times itself, I do not think it's a particularly radical <laughs> newspaper, yet compared with uh, 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 national papers in, in Japan, uh, news, uh, the uh, uh, New York Times uh, uh, offers articles analyzing the political structure which caused uh, this problem. So in this sense, I think we are in a very interesting situation where, the, of course, the uh, disaster uh, revealed the conflictual uh, aspects of national sovereignty. On the one hand, corporation and, and bureaucracy and, and, and uh, government wants to sustain the sense of uh, closure of national sovereignty, yet, in fact, citizens' movement try to find all sorts of connections outside the, the uh, realm defined by nationality. And then, in fact, in terms of, of uh, what's it, circulation of uh, information, you have two uh, different uh, dimensions of information. One is controlled by uh, uh, national TV networks and, and uh, uh, national newspapers that really try to, to uh, uh, prevent the public from uh, knowing about political uh, uh, issues. While in digital uh, uh, network, you can access all sorts of uh, um, uh, scientific and engineering information about the, uh, what is going on, actually. And then you can find the uh, more detailed information about how, for instance, a uh, nuclear reactor was designed and so forth. Um, so it is a very, very politically uh, uh, interesting period. At the same time, I think uh, you find the corresponding two uh, different uh, tendencies. One is some people became, in Japan, became extremely nationalistic because it's, it, it is the uh, time of, of a disaster. Yet, uh, the mass media, there is no historical analysis of this disaster because the last major earthquake that took place in 1923 about 19 years ago. We know a lot of looting happened, but in addition, it's a very, very important aspect of the earthquake was something like five or 6,000 minorities were brutally massacred. And that aspect has been completely censored so far. And so it is a very, very, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the geography uh, uh, is a very, very important uh, factor because it happened in, in actually the, the, uh, in Tokyo, that is the built up area and with very high uh, uh, population density. This time, this is, uh, uh, happened in a comparatively uh, uh, remote areas and population density was uh, rather low and therefore, uh, these um, violence against minorities did not take place, but you can see the potential tendency towards to unify the na nation to deal with this uh, uh, kind of disaster tendency. It's one ten tendency, but on the other hand, an increasing number of scientists and engineers are trying to create the international connections to deal with uh, uh, disaster. So um, it's a very, very interesting moment, and, and uh, I'm, I'm 
curious, of course, and then I hope the uh, Japanese society wouldn't move too much towards the uh, nationalistic uh, uh, direction, even though politically, as far as uh, uh, parliamentary politics is concerned, I cannot be uh, overly optimistic about this prospect. Thank you. So uh, my comments are going to follow up on those of my colleagues Vic and uh, Naoki Sakai in some ways and differ in other ways. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking Noah for his remarks at the beginning of the panel and panel and meetings uh, session and also all of the members of the um, CFAR. And, um, tell, tell, and, and kind of in thinking about Noah's words um, towards the end of your introduction, where you said that we want to reach out <clears throat> our hand to colleagues in Japan um, and to offer them help not only physically and emotionally. Um, and I want to say that I think all of us here wholeheartedly endorse that effort. Um, we're very, very pleased um, that you've tried to organize this. And insofar as Cornell represents some kind of an institutional uh, identity in the world, it's an absolutely important thing to do. Um, and I'm very happy that we're doing this. Um, and I also want to say that um, I was particularly interested in your comment that we want to offer help not only physically and emotionally. Um, and I want to pick up a little bit on the question of emotions um, because uh, I do want to say that I think the question of the emotions in relation to the earthquake and tsunami is a very important question. Um, and I think it uh, reflects something that many people have felt, not only in Japan, but around the world in response to this disaster, which is um, how actually does one feel this disaster, uh, especially if you weren't involved in it yourself. Um, and I think it's a very, very central question of ethics and politics right now. So I think it's very important for us to address it. Um, and I think in a way, um, events like this are maybe organized because we hope we can feel some emotion about it. Um, but in fact, it's really difficult to feel emotion about it. And our lives are very cluttered with bu busyness. Um, and we partially pay attention to things that are going on in the world. We watch the news and we're alternately uh, very moved, but sometimes feel kind of that we're interested in the voyeuristic and spectacular aspects of something like 124-foot uh, tsunami waves. It's really hard to imagine. Um, I think also uh, on, I, uh, a problem that's really quite relevant to the present situation is um, the question of solidarity. How do we extend solidarity to people who are suffering in other parts of the world? Um, and I do think it's a, it's a new challenge that's very specific to our own historical moment. Um, we have enormous media coverage. We have an enormous sense of connectedness. Um, I've heard some people talk about disaster fatigue. Um, and I think it's not really just a colloquial expression. Um, it really has to do with the fact that we're called upon to make certain choices and discriminations, even in the face of something like a massive and unexpected disaster like this. Um, the question has already come up. Are we comparing the tsunami, the earthquake, and the tsunami and the Fukushima, the threefold disaster in Japan, um, are we comparing it to Haiti, to the Haitian earthquake? Are we comparing our response to it to the tsunami in Thailand and Sri Lanka? Um, someone said to me the other day, well, but the loss of life in Japan is greater than anything we've ever seen in recent tsunami. Well, in fact, statistically, that's wrong. Um, the Sri Lanka tsunami had many more victims than the Japan tsunami, numerically speaking. Um, but there's this implicit question of comparison that comes up. Um, I think another very difficult question that's come up right now um, is, is how to express solidarity, solidarity and mourning for the victims of the earthquake and tsunami itself and the victims of the Fukushima disasters. They're somewhat different, even though they're interconnected. And one has to see a kind of difference between them. 
Um, and I've also heard people say, well, the, the people in northeastern Japan have been completely forgotten because everyone's talking about Fukushima. Everyone's very preoccupied with the question of the nuclear threat. And perhaps partly because of the question of containment that Professor Sakai referred to, um, radioactivity can be carried across the ocean and so forth. Um, so I think these questions are really extremely central to the issues that we're facing right now, ethically and politically, in relation to the disasters. Um, I think that's one reason why, in thinking about the panel, we actually sort of divided it into two parts. And this is the more informational, sort of analytical part. But we really wanted to close with, uh, with something that was a little bit more somber in tone, less analytical, perhaps, um, that really tried to get at some of the feeling that needs to be expressed on this occasion. Um, and so, uh, like everyone, I, I feel very overwhelmed by what's happening in Japan and practically speechless um, in, in the face of it. And I think perhaps speechlessness is a very appropriate response. Um, we don't even know the names of tens of thousands of victims, or at least, at least 12,000 victims, I think it was, 14,000 people who are still missing um, in Japan. It's difficult to mourn for people whose names you don't know. Um, but this isn't the first time that things like this have happened. And we do have some kind of historical memory to draw on. Um, and I somehow felt, in a way, that perhaps I really should try to rely on or capture some of the responses of my scholarly colleagues in Japan and what they have been writing about this and what they have been thinking about this, rather than feeling that I had the insight to deal with it entirely on my own. Um, so in the concluding part of my remarks, I'm just going to refer very briefly to um, a short article that one of my colleagues um, wrote that's going to be published soon in a Japanese uh, intellectual journal. It's called uh, Contemporary Thought, or Gendai Shiso. Um, and um, it's a special collection on the recent events. Um, and the scholar is Professor Mima Tatsuya, um, who works at Kyoto University. Um, and he's somewhat of an STS type of person. Um, he works on medicine and issues of medicine and society. Um, and he wrote a short article to contribute to this kind of general collection of, of pieces that were reflections on the recent events. Um, really speaking from his perspective as a somewhat society and technology oriented scholar. Um, and he was very interested with the, he has been interested for several years in the question of risk society um, and the increasing tendency for um, especially advanced society to see themselves as needing to manage various types of risks. Um, and how the responses to the tsunami, earthquake, and nuclear disasters um, really um, kind of bo both, re both reflect the impact and influence on Japan as a whole with the notion of managing risk um, and also proposed challenges to managing risks. Um, but actually, he first began, began with some references to literature and film. Um, and I think um, it, it's important to read a, a couple of these um, or refer to a couple of these. Some of you might know about, about some of them. And I, I think they're, they're, they're moments when fragments kind of jump up at you in, in, in times like this, and they have a very vivid sense. Um, and they're, they're really, uh, they refer to two post-war uh, post artists. One of them is a filmmaker who's very well known to all of you, Kurosawa Akira, who wrote a great deal about nuclear disaster. Um, and the other is probably less well known because this artist uh, died in the 1950s. His name is Sakaguchi Ango. Um, and I think um, Professor Mima wanted to just kind of touch on or have us reflect on two aspects of this, of what's happening. Um, by using these two examples. So the first is um, referring to the film called Yume or Dreams, which was produced in uh, 1990 by Kurosawa Akira a few years before he died, about a decade before he died, actually. Um, and the film Dreams is uh, actually based uh, loosely on an earlier, uh, early 20th century novel by the very well-known novelist Natsume Soseki called Ten Nights of Dream. I mean, it strings together a sequence of eight dreams. Um, and it's rather surreal, surrealistic in tone. Um, but the sixth dream, 
is called Mount Fuji in red. And if some of you have seen this film, you may recognize it. Um, but the sequence on Mount Fuji in red um, was very interesting to Professor Mima precisely because it reflected one aspect of the contemporary situation, which is that there's a so-called natural disaster sort of, and I'm superimposed on top of this is a disaster that is more clearly located in technology or the man-made aspect of society. Um, so this portion of the film shows a volcanic eruption in the famous Mount Fuji, um, and this triggers a nuclear meltdown um, in a nearby nuclear reactor. So it's actually an extremely prescient part of this film that Kurosawa, the last film that Kurosawa made at the end of his life. Um, and it gives very spectacular visual effects in the film because everything takes place against the background of these um, sparks and flames spewing out of the volcano. And then on top of that, the uh, flames and, and explosions coming out of the nuclear reactor. So extremely vivid and colorful scenes. Um, and um, there is a scene there uh, that, that Mima, Professor Mima uh, singles out, which is that um, people are chaotically fleeing from this double disaster. And a woman who's fleeing with a child on her back encounters a worker who's fleeing from the nuclear disaster. Um, and he looks, he points to the smoke that's coming out of the reactor, and he says, look, there are three colors in this smoke. Um, and then he says to her, the, the red is the smoke from plutonium-239. And if you inhale a billionth of a gram, you will become ill. The yellow is strontium-90. And if this enters your bone marrow and accumulates there, you will contract leukemia. And the purple is cesium-37. If this gathers in the gonads, it will create genetic mutations. Um, and what Professor Mima points out about the film, which was made already about 15 years ago, is that, of course, these things don't have colors. Um, so the effects of nuclear radiation until they begin to have an impact on the body are totally invisible. Um, and so what the film dramatizes, among many other things, is the problem of dealing with dangers that are invisible. Um, and we have to somehow use various means to assess them or adequate to uh, be, be, well, prepare our responses to them without experiencing or being able to see them or touch them. Um, and secondly, um, he actually has a quote from a very um, well-known essay that was written in Japan right before the end of the war. Um, and I'm going to read this too because um, as Vic and Naoki have already indicated, um, the rhetoric of war and the rhetoric of disaster has become very commingled in Japan at the present time, and it's something that requires commentary. Um, interestingly, uh, this rather heretical essay was written um, towards the end of the war uh, when people had already experienced several years of exhortations from the government towards a total self-sacrifice in the war effort and tremendous glorification of the state and the war effort. Um, and in the face of that, the writer Sakaguchi Ango wrote an essay which he called On Being Decadent. Um, and in this essay, he basically uh, kind of takes a position of, of extolling all of the virtues which are precisely the opposite of everything that was glorified during the war, the chastity of the widows, uh, the self-sacrifice of the war heroes, and so forth. Um, and he describes uh, an attitude uh, of the common citizen during the war, although he personalizes it as his own attitude. Um, it's, it's tricky to read, uh, but as you read it, uh, you realize it's, it's very, very deeply critical of the stance of the citizen during the war, um, and, but it's presented in a kind of parodic way. So he wrote, during, during the war, I trembled. Maybe he wrote this, sorry, he wrote this right after the war was over. He wouldn't have been able to write all these things unless it was just a few months after the end of the war. During the war, I trembled every day with fear. There were bombs. Tokyo was firebombed. There were bombs exploding overhead. Um, and yet I was spellbound by a kind of beauty that I found in the landscape. Uh, during the last months of the war, I never needed to think. Uh, there was no humanity. There was only beauty. Um, there were no robbers, there were no criminals in Tokyo at the time. Um, Japan during the war was like a dream world, a lie, 
nothing but empty beauty blooming in profusion. If you could just forget to think it was the most grand and carefree spectacle in the world. Of course we had ceaseless fear of the bombing, but if you didn't think about it, you could just be happy. We could just watch in rapt fascination. I was like a fool. I played with the war in total innocence. Um, and I read these really uh, very powerful, I think, and provocative words written right at the end of the war, um, because I think they do have to do with some of the questions that Vic and now he have brought up um, and that I want to remind us in terms of the complexity of the event that we're dealing with, um, which requires from us both a kind of analytical, political, aesthetic, and emotional response, um, and the, the difficulties of finding an emotional response. And I think the, the courage and the bravery that it's required um, in the face of a kind of call on everyone to unify and be sympathetic in the face of disasters like this, to, to be somewhat questioning and to be somewhat critical. I mean, to try to, to really be analytical about the forms in which the response to the disaster take place. Um, and just very briefly to mention some of the points that Professor Mima made about risk management. Um, he, he talks about um, the way in which uh, risk management invokes a kind of language of scientific accuracy. Um, it always has to involve prevention. Um, and yet this language actually has very differential effects on people. So if we think about it just uh, in terms of some very uh, everyday kind of examples, um, apparently the Japanese government issued many statements um, soon after the nuclear reactor disaster, um, which in Japanese reads, Suni kenko ni higai no deru deru de wa nai, to try to reassure the citizens. So at the moment, there is no... Uh, nothing emerging which will damage your health. This is a, a line to sort of reassure the citizens. But of course, the word in Japanese, suguni, or right now, or in the immediate future, nothing will damage your health, is extremely ambiguous. Um, and so th this, this kind of really gives us a sense of what's happening with this type of risk prevention and the types of things that have to be uh, taken care of. Um, and at the same time, in order to predict risk and deal with worst case scenarios, um, one has to take preemptive and preventive measures. I mean, these have very differential effects, so that as we saw in the case of Fukushima, um, when the orders to evacuate came, the people who lived immediately in the area actually didn't want to go. Other people thought it was a great idea for them to evacuate and something worse might happen, but they didn't want to go because they had to leave their vegetables in the garden. They couldn't sell them. Um, some of you may have read the farmers didn't want to leave their cows. Victor said they brought them to protests in Tokyo. But you know, there were uh, some of these rather heartbreaking stories. I, I can't leave my cows dying. Um, and so these policies don't affect everybody in the same way. Um, uh, uh, Mima-san also talks quite a bit about the way that the rhetoric of war has to be has, has come to be relied upon to deal with the crises. For example, the very word evacuation, or tetai in Japanese, is a word that was used during the war for evacuation. Um, some people still can remember this. Um, and um, he expresses a concern that relying on this kind of mobilization, um, as Professor Sakai said, tends to leave people with the idea that everybody's equally at the point of the disaster, so you don't have to worry about the differential impacts of the disaster. But in fact, the differential impacts of the disaster are extraordinary. Um, and these, I think, are, are lessons that we have to think about for the US as well as Japan. Um, where are nuclear reactors located? Well, they're generally located where poor people live. They're generally located in places with declining economic situations where the people are happy to have any kind of job. Um, we saw who, who are the workers who are working in Fukushima. Their names are never released. Only one of them has ever been released to us. They're part-time workers. They're farmers who don't have sufficient income. And they're migrant workers. Some of them are probably foreign workers. We don't know who they are. Um, and they're playing the most heroic role in all of this. Um, 
And finally, um, I mean, just in terms of earthquake prevention, of course, the areas that are most vulnerable to earthquake prevention are wooden frame buildings and very densely congregated in areas, and these are usually low-income areas. So he is really asking people to kind of try to think a little bit more, not so much about these disasters as kind of simply everybody is equally a, a victim, but to really look at the differential impact on, on the Japanese and foreign and minority population in Japan, um, in addition to um, the many other complexities that we're dealing with. So thank you. I think that's the Thank you, all three of you, for your uh, talks. I think that was great. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions, if we have any questions for any of the speakers. Um, saving that, we hope to see it. I have a question um, on the implications uh, of this nuclear crisis for American nuclear policy. And beyond our country globally, what is the impact of Fukushima? Speaking to this, whoever wants to answer that. <laughs> Impact for nuclear policy in the U.S. and beyond and the beyond U.S. Japan. globally. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we all probably have, have a few <laughs> thoughts about it. Um, I mean, I, I think they're enormous, and I think we're we're obviously seeing um, a certain um, a certain level of kind of popular distrust of, of building more nuclear reactors is, is definitely being expressed around the U.S. Um, it's also very powerful in Europe, and as you know, the Germans um, have actually passed um, legislation recently that, that is putting a moratorium on building any nuclear reactors. One, of, one thing that I received during these past few weeks that was, was one of the most touching letters to me actually was um, a letter from a German woman who, with whom my son had stayed with, as a high school student, and out of the blue, I had a letter from her, and she said, you know, it must be really hard for you to see all these things happening in Japan. And I feel uh, so irresponsible that I didn't protest the building of nuclear reactors in Germany more fully. And, and I was amazed to get this. It was really that, that she felt this like, it's such a personal thing and she would write to me about it. So I think there is a popular uh, level of, of emotion and anxiety um, that's coming out about this everywhere. Um, I think the way it's handled will be hard to predict. Um, as we know, the energy industry and the nuclear industry is very powerful in this country, probably just as powerful as it is in Japan, although some of the political mechanisms may be different. Um, I think the um, public relations, to put it politely, uh, being released by all of the uh, major energy companies um, in the world right now is, is massive. I'm, I'm just stunned by it. And I think it's really an attempt to overcome the ordinary citizen's sense of fear about these things. Um, so, uh, and of course, President Obama was for nuclear power uh, <laughs> when he was campaigning and when he was elected. So uh, it, there's going to be a long way to go, but I think it would be excellent to um, revive that and, and hopefully to good effect. So I don't know whether now he and Vic want to say something. Um, I mentioned that the, the European movement about Fukushima, that is the, I think, already I think, uh, they uh, succeeded in organizing uh, uh, quite a, a number of demonstrations in France and a nuclear demonstration it's spreading in Europe too. Um, in general, <coughs> What is very, very interesting to me here is that, again, I think in, in the real sense, uh, in the concrete terms, the possibility of international politics is emerging out of this disaster. And in fact, um, already because of the, the um, technological uh, uh, expertise cannot be contained within one nation. So it's already uh, uh, um, scientists are collaborating. And therefore, that the, they cannot come up, so far they cannot come up with the kind of, of, of organization in which the um, international collaboration can be actualized. So from now on, I think there will be a long process in which there will be a two different uh, agenda 
will uh, uh, compete with one another. And then um, one thing that is most important is that, again, uh, that is, I think, implicit uh, uh, message about uh, uh, this um, disaster is that most important part is proper investigation has to be conducted. But who said what and what kind of judgments was made and what kind of uh, investment was made by corporation and government and what sort of uh, committee was created and who were uh, uh, in, in, um, in, involved and what kind of people actually criticized or uh, uh, a warning and, and so forth. And these, uh, it's not just a, a, you know, a one-time thing, but it has to be analyzed. And it has to be, uh, in a sense, um, come to, uh, it has to come to some kind of judgment, which is open to public. And I think it, this possibility is uh, arising, but at the same time, of course, uh, the nuclear industry and government are very, very strong. And then they also have uh, international connections and they have resources. So, so um, it will be a very, very um, uh, important political process and, and uh, I would like to, to see how the uh, new um, relations or uh, people's connections can, can develop, uh, I, I say, transnational. Well, I certainly agree with that. Um, it would be delightful if, if more international collaboration would emerge out of this, just because it seems to me that energy policy is inherently so competitive, uh, and particularly as uh, as pertains to petroleum-based uh, technologies. And, and I guess the, the lesson, as far as I'm concerned, what, what I would hope is the lesson that would be taken is that, uh, that those that, that have any handle uh, at all uh, financially, uh, intellectually, uh, technologically, or whatever, on uh, on environ relatively environmentally friendly uh, solutions uh, for energy problems, uh, particularly in this country, since we have the biggest one in the world, uh, but but elsewhere as well, uh, should uh, should hurry up and uh, and get those on the table. Uh, I know that's uh, that's uh, far easier uh, said than done. Uh, but I was just looking at a program uh, last night on public television having to do with algae uh, and uh, as an energy source, and, uh, and even that, you know, when it's presented that way, so it looks looks pretty promising, even though the, the time frame uh, of projection in terms of commercial use is, is way in the future. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we're, some of you may be aware that we're confronting a situation here in upstate New York uh, uh, with regard to natural gas. Uh, as well, and of course, uh, it's been easy to think of natural gas as the, as the big transitional uh, energy technology uh, between uh, the you know uh, ordinary oil um, and uh, and other uh, other technologies in the future when they come online. Uh, but uh, it's a, it's been a struggle on the part of people in this area, uh, and and particularly in Pennsylvania and Wyoming and a number of other places uh, where these technologies, drilling technologies, have been applied. Uh, it's a struggle to get the information out uh, of people's experiences with this and the number of water uh, sources that have gone bad and, and so on. And uh, it, it's looking very much like uh, natural gas. It's not nearly such a, a nice, clean uh, energy source uh, as was thought. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, in that way, as well as many other ways, the problem gets more and more difficult every single day. Uh, so good luck. Uh, I guess <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> um, do you have any more questions? Sure. I'm, I'm curious about, um, so now you mentioned the last huge disaster, uh, 1923, which certainly on this scale would have been the last one. I'm also interested in going back to 1995, Kobe, and um, what happened there versus what's happening now. And do you see... Any differences? I, I guess there's two specific things that I'm interested in. One is if there are differences in in the discourses and the coverage of these disasters uh, about whatever element you want to choose, the government response or whatever. Um, and also, um, 
I know that in the aftermath of Kobe, there was the creation of a lot of NGOs and the strengthening of civil society, uh, Matsukuri projects and so forth throughout Japan. And I'm wondering if that infrastructure is still there and sort of being uh, mobilized more quickly to take care of what's happening now uh, in the Northeast. I don't know. I don't know how plugged in you are to what's going on there. So if you know it. It's okay. Yeah. No, no I, uh, this is something I'm particularly interested in, these kind of civil society uh, issues. But as a matter of fact, I, I have not been aware, I haven't come across a lot of evidence of Japanese NGOs operating uh, up there. And my sense is that this disaster, compared to, say, the Kobe one, has such a totally kind of stunning effect uh, that, and, and the complexities of knowing where to intervene and how to intervene. And this has been expressed in, in the gov Japanese government statements, which have also been, been criticized abroad, but discouraging foreign NGOs mm -hmm. from immediately coming in uh, and setting up operations uh, because of the fear that uh, that kind of kind of chaotic and unplanned sort of introduction of, of, uh, of all of these very you know well-meaning uh, groups is going to increase the confusion and, and uh, the problem. Uh, and, and also you have the, the, the matter that, uh, that Japan in a larger sense, despite its you know, financial problems, uh, heavy debt and so on, nevertheless doesn't need the money compared to many other places that are hit by similar kinds of, uh, of tsunamis. So I'm, I'm just, I'm really not sure, I, that's a very interesting question you, you raised, but I'm not, not sure what, uh, how, the, how the role of NGOs in, in trying to, to solve some aspects of this problem is shaping up. Maybe you want to more about it. Yeah. Yes, um, I uh, heard a lot about the uh, sort of volunteerism, that is, uh, comparative young people volunteer to move from the unaffected areas of Japan and, and join the and help, you know, the help victims of the earthquake and so forth. But, uh, initially, yes, in, uh, say, March, uh, third week of March, I, I, uh, I read a lot of articles about these volunteers. But recently, I haven't uh, uh, seen in, uh, in Japanese newspapers. So um, I just wondered what uh, happened. But uh, again, it reflected, particularly as you mentioned, that right, in, in Kobe earthquake, that movement was very, very, um, what should I say, uh, remarkable, so to say. Because for the first time, young, um, so-called apolitical, young uh, Japanese began to, to move and so forth. Um, but it seems uh, it is very, very difficult to, to organize. And then, uh, again, uh, Unfortunately, I think uh, uh, Vic already mentioned that is uh, a, a lot of demonstrations are now taking place, uh, criticizing, um, uh, for instance, um, electric uh, power companies, and they are handling of the, the disasters and so forth. Yet, uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, read much about it in, in um, newspapers. So I have to look for the the. Um, Websites, whether the, the activist website, whether they actually uh, show you uh, what's going on, and 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 on top of that, I think uh, one thing that uh, is I think um, uh, Brett mentioned is that again, in the case of uh, Kobe earthquake, it was clearly differential. That is to say, poor and and mainly uh, Chinese and Korean. Uh, residents in, the, in that area were most <coughs> affected. And there, so far, I haven't seen any analysis about the way the victims, uh, social strata of victims, and what sort of people were most severely affected, who are now um, uh, uh, suffering most, and so forth. And so, um, again, that is something we have to, to watch for. Uh, I, I haven't been 
I haven't been following this in a lot of detail, but I do want to say that um, one of my friends who lives in Kyoto, who works a lot with Japanese women's groups, um, has been forwarding me tons of stuff about ac actions that women's groups have been taking to be helpful. So it's another example of volunteerism. I haven't had time to read all the emails and see exactly what's going on, but I, I think there's a great deal of effort to help. Uh, I'm from Miyako, where Disaster, tsunami, and all of that. And uh, in the community, they are not, they can't accept volunteers because it's such a um, remote area and uh, infrastructure is totally damaged. And uh, they, and uh, if volunteer people, To help, they need places to, to stay, stay. Food, they have to. Well, right. food is really one thing, but to stay. Mm -hmm. And they don't have place to stay. Oh, of course, now that traffic is uh, open, but uh, they couldn't go in there. So only volunteer people is someone who has a friend or a family where they can stay. And uh, that uh, hotels and so on were all designed for Unfortunately, that physically, we can't. Momoko, do you have some comments about your, your friends, the Potters, who are, which is the city that they're living in? Miyagi Prefecture. Miyagi Prefecture, right. Okay. Actually, uh, just in the interest of time, because we got a little bit of a late start, we're going to have to move on to the readings now. But if anybody has any questions, um, I'm sure we'd all be willing to stick around and answer them. Me in particular. Uh, sorry. Uh, so we can um, move on to the first reading. That's Professor Gaber, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe my colleagues could also yeah. join me so that we're all sure. here. And do you want to sit or stand? Maybe each one of us should stand. and Katsirano and Saori Pikawa for joining us uh, for the final part of this uh, event um, in which we, all of us would really simply like to offer a few readings, musical performances um, as a way of um, expressing the, the enormous sadness that we feel about everything that's happened in Japan. Um, Naomi and I actually had quite a bit of discussion about how to choose what to read, um, and it's not the easiest thing. Um, but I finally decided that I would read a poem of, of mourning that was written by uh, a Hiroshima poet, um, Toge Sankichi, um, who was very well known uh, after uh, Hiroshima. He died at, at a young age of, of 36. Um, and I think this somewhat has to do with who do you address in a situation like this and the difficulty of addressing 
the tremendous numbers of people who, who lost their lives in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and he chose to address his poem to an old woman. Um, and it's a poem of mourning, but it's also a poem about survival. Uh, so you mustn't die, old woman. You mustn't leave us like this. Old woman, muttering away all day long, your body that is only sinews and flabby skin stretched out under a thin quilt too heavy for you before an orange crate, Butsudan, that's a Buddha altar, in a bare room, seven by ten, in a corner of a home for widows that creaks in the wind. The pale sunlight comes in from the west, from over the hills of Koi, lighting up the evening dust on the window pane, giving a gentle glow to the white lock of hair at your temple. In this late autumn light, once again, you've turned their yellowed faces this way, your dear son, your wife, your grandson, and you're talking with them, aren't you? The faded photo on the altar, slightly cracked, seems almost to smile. Yesterday, someone from the office brought you these gold-capped front teeth dug up right at the spot where your son's desk stood. Rumor has it his wife and son, covered with burns like all the neighbors in Dobashi, crawled down to the Tenma River close by and one after another were swept away. Day after day under that blazing sun, I took one hand as came from the other. You searched a Hiroshima that offered no shade over mountains of rubble, climbing, climbing across fallen bridges, north, south, east, west, from the crossing that rumor had it, had become a mortuary to temples and schools on the edge of town and small aid stations on the islands. You leafed through the torn pages of registers of the injured. You searched all over among people still groaning. It was on the seventh day, headed for a village hospital back in the hills you'd heard of by chance, as you crossed once again the burned out waste. Until then, you'd been strong-willed to the point of stubbornness. But that day, suddenly squatting beside the broken off stump of a telephone pole that still smoldered and sputtered, you said, enough is enough, more than enough. Why should I have had to suffer like this? Raising your voice, you cried, your umbrella tumbled into the ash and a small cloud of dust arose, nothing, absolutely nothing, in the absurdly blue sky but a single wisp of white smoke rising ever so slowly. You lost your husband while you were still young. Your only son, whom you supported by becoming a seamstress, a washerwoman, had TB for five or six years after college, finally recovered and he took a bride. He had a son and six months later on that morning, August 6, 1945, he set off laughing as always. Uh, the baby on her back, his bride was called out to clear fire breaks and never came back. The three of them left you alone at home and never came back. A woman, old woman, you mustn't die like this. Is it exhaustion from searching among the ashes? Is it the effect of the poison that's still here, weary, soon to doze off? You yourself no longer understand clearly the words you mutter. Your grief that is beyond grief, bitterness beyond bitterness, will join with the thoughts of all those who lost, lost loved ones in the war and become strong enough again to keep such a thing as that war from ever happening again in this world. Keeping only to yourself your muttered words, your dry tears, you mustn't die like this. You mustn't go. I have, a cho I have chosen a poem by Kenji Yazawa. I'm in a moment to be a defeated by the rain. Actually, I was going to ask the very sensitive reader question, if you don't mind. All right, okay. Uh, I actually chose this because uh, um, this is what I saw. All those people remind me of this poem. And I, I took this liberty and it just had a short message for Japanese people or people who are suffering disaster. Uh, this is what I saw on the news. So much has been said and shown on the news. Many of you have lost everything in the earthquake and the tsunami, yet you are inspirational. You make me proud to be Japanese. That true hardship has just begun. 
I am praying daily that you will be confident and strengthened and everything you need will be given to you. With this. Yes, um, English first and then Japanese. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is the poem um, by Kenji Miyazawa. Be not defeated by the rain, nor let the wind prove you better. Succumb not to the snows of winter, nor be bested by the heat of summer. Be strong in body, unfettered by desire, not enticed to anger. Cultivate a quiet joy. Count yourself last in everything. Put others before you. Watch well and listen closely. Hold the learned lessons dear. A thatched roof house in a meadow nestled in a pine grove's shade. A handful of rice, some miso, and a few vegetables to suffice for the day. If to the east a child lies sick, go forth and nurse him to health. If to the west an old lady stands exhausted, go forth and relieve her of the burden. If to the south a man lies dying, go forth with words of courage to dispel his fear. If to the north an argument or fight ensues, go forth and beg them to stop wasting their effort and spirit. In times of drought, shed tears of sympathy. In summer's cold, walk in concern and empathy. Stand aloof of the unknowing masses, better dismissed as useless than flattered as a great man. This is my goal, the person I strive to become. あめにも負けず、風にも負けず、雪にも夏の暑さにも負けぬ、丈夫な体を持ち、欲はなく、決して怒らず、いつも静かに笑っている。一日に玄米四合と味噌と少しの野菜を食べ、あらゆることを自分
very hard to speak after all this wonderful performance and uh, reading poems. And actually, I really want to thank my colleagues and organizers for this opportunity because um, it's been a kind of a difficult time for myself because my family has been affected. And uh, uh, I lost my friend in Miyagi. And frankly, I have been refusing to. So I have been invited by many organizations to talk about this issue on campus and outside of campus, but um, so far I have been refusing to speak <laughs> uh, because I haven't found a way to sort of articulate how I should understand all these uh, changes and uh, events. Um, so I think it really relates to what uh, Brett said, uh, differential impacts. And probably I should speak um, based on my personal experience, but also what I observed while I was in Japan for about two weeks, uh, right after the disaster happened. And so, you know, I, I'm not reading anything here, but just sort of bits and pieces of my personal impression observation. But it's also a kind of response to all my colleagues, um, um, very uh, inspiring um, sort of observation of the situation. So I want to start with this idea of differential impact. And to talk about this in a personal way is probably the best way to think through this question of differential impact. I don't think uh, my experience and my position really presents any kind of typical or entirety of uh, those big things. So I just want to clarify that before I start to talk about this. Um, the what struck me most while I was in Japan was very much related to what actually Big and Naoki said about how this public discourse continued to conceal or repress uh, all these differential impacts that people are experiencing. And interesting thing about this is that um, the American side, American discourse is pretty much sharing um, the same kind of orientation, ideological orientation with the intellectual discourse and the media discourse in Japan, as Professor Sakai pointed out. And there's a deep, deep complicity in a way that, in a strange way, that um, even the Japanese media embrace this idea that the Japanese people are enduring and, you know, they are really ready to um, endure anything. Uh, that's why uh, Japanese society can really live through this trauma and disaster. And it's really, what's really so shocking for me was that all these intellectuals and professors and uh, media who were supposed to really address all these differential impacts, uh, they in fact really work to conceal and repress all these different voices of dis dis dissatisfaction and frustration, even anger, that I felt um, when I talked to my friends and uh, families. And so, I think that's one issue that we really need to think through. And that's probably one of the ways in which we have to think about how uh, this kind of globally significant uh, event continue to be nationalized and try to always confine within this kind of narrow sort of scope uh, of understanding. And so that's, the, that's one way I really like to talk about and based on the kind of interaction I had with my friend and family. Also, um, one important uh, differential impact I observed was the tension between people in Fukushima and people in Tokyo, for example. And uh, people in Fukushima were extremely angry with the ways in which uh, this disaster, this power plant disaster was discussed, uh, precisely because much of the uh, energy the power plant creates goes to Tokyo, actually. It's supposed to be, you know, sort of uh, rather glamorous, lavish lifestyle of, of urban space, whereas these people have to continue to endure uh, this constant sort of threat and disaster. And I hear the same kind of complaint because my hometown is very close to Tokai village. Tokai, Tokai is another sort of village which has a large power plant. And uh, about maybe 15 years ago, uh, there was also kind of minor disaster in Tokai. And again, my family uh, was sort of kind of affected by the disaster as well. And even though the government really never acknowledged that there was any kind of um, uh, contamination, right after the disaster, probably within five or six years, I began to see a lot of uh, cancer patients, actually, in my town, as well as nearby village. 
And then, you know, you start to suspect that probably there was some kind of contamination in the area. But uh, local government and central government continue to argue that, well, it had nothing to do with uh, the increase, dramatically increased number in the deaths of cancer patients. So, you know, there is no scientific evidence that we can rely on, but I think it's been a very consistent problem, the ways in which Professor Sakai talked about how government try to, and also its associate try to really minimize the impact of a disaster all the time, and really, to, in a way, trivialize um, the sort of um, the magnitude of the disaster. So it actually, this time, again, reminded me of the ways in which government uh, dealt with the Tokai problem, Tokai disaster. And just one more just quick point that I really uh, felt uh, why I was there was that um, the, the, the way people responded to this disaster was very interesting. I mean, going back to this question of whether people are really voluntarily so to try to help those who are affected or not. Um, what I observed was that those who actually extended the most immediate help were not, of course, government, uh, not Petco, and in fact, uh, self-initiated really local governments in a very small village, we ha which happened to have some kind of resources to help out some people, but also um, some really uh, grassroots organization, as well as those who went through some kind of disaster in Kobe. So these people are the first people who really responded to the disaster, and then they just couldn't wait for government to take any kind of action. So, um, you know, as some, some of you said, uh, that in fact, uh, people couldn't have access to the sort of affected area, but they just went there on their own, and they created their own network to try to provide food when people didn't have anything to eat for nearly 10 days and two weeks, actually, uh, in some areas. So, um, I think these people, and when you talk to these people, actually I spent about three, four days in the shelter, actually, in my hometown, because, uh, uh, one thing is out of, frankly, curiosity. <laughs> I really wanted to see how uh, people are helping each other out, but also uh, some ethical, personal ethical choice that I just wanted to do it. And uh, people from Iwate and uh, those refugees from Iwate and Miyagi um, were moved, some of them were moved to Ibaraki, and so I went there and spent three or four days. And when I talked to these people, um, it's not about gamma or endurance or anything. Actually, frankly, it's a frustration and anger that they, they are constantly expressing that. Why is it that the government is not doing anything about the situation? Why is it that uh, they couldn't predict this kind of disaster? And so um, I think also those who are volunteering are not thinking about how great we are as a Japanese, actually. I have never heard of that kind of saying at all, actually. On the other hand, on the contrary, they are really talking about, you know, it would be great if we can have much greater network beyond national boundary. So we can really gather all our efforts to try to help this out. So um, there's a real sort of fissure or maybe gap between the ways in which government try to control the whole situation and also try to create generic discourse. And those who are really trying to deal with as a kind of 